Thanks, everybody. Delighted to have you here. Kenneth Hosta will be speaking to us today. He's a PhD from Ghent University, uh, works in the high performance computing team there. He also is the maintainer of EasyBuild, uh, a build system for high, per high performance computing deployments. To it. Kenneth, it's yours. All right, thank you very much for the introduction. Um, I should say I'm not the only maintainer of EasyBuild. There's more than one, which is good. Um, so what I want to talk to today, talk about today, is the work that we have done in EasyBuild to make it easy for people to contribute back to EasyBuild. Um, and I'll explain why we're doing that and how we're doing that. So first off, I'm sure most people here know what GitHub is, but I felt obliged to have a slide on it. Um, it's basically the place where open source is being developed right now. It's absolutely huge. There's 24 million users, over 60 million repositories out there. Um, and they recently crossed the boundary of 100 million merged pull requests. So that's absolutely amazing. It also has an issue tracker, code review stuff, wiki, websites, um, a whole bunch of things. Underneath of GitHub, there's Git, which is the, the version control system that Linus Torvalds created, so the same guy behind the Linux kernel. Um, it's certainly the most popular version control system today. There have been many others in the past. Um, and this is what's underneath Git. So it was designed to have very good performance, even for very large projects like the Linux kernel, uh, to support nonlinear development, distributed workflow, working offline, and then getting back online to share your work. And it was also designed not to be like the old CVS system. That was one of the explicit design goals. Um, internally, it works a little bit like blockchains before blockchain was cool. Um, <laughs> So they, they have that going. All the hashing and all that stuff going on is pretty much also what's going on in the blockchain. Um, so most of you will be familiar, hopefully, with the Git workflow a little bit. Even if you're not, that's fine. That's sort of the point of the talk, so don't worry. So typically what you do is you edit a file. If you want to use Emacs, you can. Um, you then go to Git, you create a branch, and you check out the branch. You want to commit your work by staging the file with Git add and using Git commit and hopefully a useful message to explain what you did in, this, in these changes. And then you typically push it out to a remote repository in general, which is typically GitHub. So that's where you share your work with others. Um, that was very high level what, what, GitHub, uh, what Git is. Uh, now I want to go back a little bit in history and look at version control. This is not my idea to do this. Um, this was done in a blog post on gitprime.com as well, and basically stole their idea and expanded on it a little bit. So what they are doing is looking at the um, search traffic via Google Trends for all these version control systems. And 100% here means the highest search volume we will be seeing in this graph. Um, so CVS was very popular for a long time, but since certainly 2004, it has declined a lot in populari popularity, of course, because of other version control systems coming up, like Subversion, um, like also Mercurial. So all of these names are hopefully at least familiar to you. Um, and then Git came in. And Git, the, the, the search volume of Git quickly went up, and the others, mainly Subversion and Mercurial, suffered from that, basically. So Git became a lot popular, a lot more popular. And Subversion and Mercurial are like at 10% in terms of search volume and Google compared to Git. Um, now, why did Git become so popular? What happened there? Is it technically a lot better, or is there also other factors? So Git started here, it was like, I think this was Git 1.0, 2005. For a long time it was, okay, going up a little bit, but what's this spike all of a sudden? So something happened there. And that was basically GitHub. So GitHub launched uh, publicly April 2008, which is here. And then shortly after you see the spike on, uh, on interest in Git. So at least that's, that's my conclusion from this. You can never be sure, but... Let's see. There's another spike here. So this was a news item. Um, like Linus Torvalds got a GitHub pull request on the Linux kernel. And he basically said, no, I don't want to do GitHub pull requests because they're doing it totally wrong. Send me a patch via mail, and that's how we work in the Linux kernel. A lot of people were surprised. And certainly for me, that's when I learned that Linus Torvalds was the designer of Git. I didn't know that before this. So he, he designed Git, which is underneath GitHub, but he doesn't like GitHub. It's a bit painful. Um, so the interest in Git seems to follow the interest in GitHub. That's what I get from this graph. And Subversion and Mercurial are like one-tenth 
of interest, if you want to put it like that, in terms of search volume. There's another small um, peak here. It is like the 100%, the highest search volumes they have seen uh, for Git up until now. Can anyone guess what happened here? This is pretty recent. This is like FOSDAM last year. Yeah. Sorry? A security issue? Or yeah. uh, it could be that, actually. What, what I found was like g tech companies complaining about Trump, his immigration ban. And GitHub was one of them. <laughs> no. if, if this is actually the peak, I'm not sure. Many people were like, GitHub? What's Git, what's Git actually? And they started searching for it. Maybe that was it. Um, so is Git popular thanks to GitHub? Well, there seems to be a correlation, but we can never really be sure. Uh, maybe there was even some kind of feedback loop. So. Git caused more interest in uh, GitHub caused more interest in Git, which in turn made GitHub more popular because people had to collaborate. Maybe that was it, or maybe it's just because GitHub has Git in the name and Google Trends. You cannot really pull those apart, so I'm just talking bullshit. But I don't know. Um, it's certainly the most popular version control system out there today, so I, I don't think anyone will contest that. Um, so you'll basically have to learn it if you want to contribute to an open source project. You're kind of stuck to it. Everybody is. Um, so you'll have to learn it. You have to learn how to use it, right? Now, that's a bit of a, a pain point in Git. It has a pretty steep learning curve. This is the the top three questions on Stack Overflow that are tagged with Git. Now, the questions here are not too surprising. Like, how do you undo a commit? It's not really straightforward. Um, even from the help, how do I delete a Git branch both on your machine and on GitHub? How do you do that? And what's the difference between git, and git pull and git fetch? It sounds like the same, but it's very different. These get a lot of views. So this, this has 6 million views. Now, in comparison, the how to exit Vim only has 1.3 million views. <laughs> so people seem to have a lot more problems with this than exiting Vim. So there seems to be an issue there. This was a, a recent tweet from a guy that works at GitHub that had to Google something to undo a last commit. So this stuff is hard. I mean, even people at GitHub find it hard. I hope he was okay with me using the, the screenshot of his tweet. <laughs> and this is on Quora. So one guy asked just in general, uh, why is Git so hard to learn? And then many people were replying. So many important people at, at important positions. And this guy said, it's the pearl of source control system. <laughs> and that's not a good thing. So yeah, it's difficult. Also, Git is not for everybody. Um, the main target audience is software developers. People that develop software have to work together in teams to develop software. It makes it very easy to do that. Um, it was designed for these kind of people. Now, a lot of computer people, to, to use a term like this, don't need it for the daily work. If you're not really developing software, you don't really need Git, so why do you have to learn it? Um, some don't have the time to learn it. Others try to learn it, but can't seem to figure it out. And not, not everybody knows somebody that can help them, because that has been very helpful for me, certainly, when learning Git. You have a Git expert in your office. And whenever you're stuck um, and you can ask somebody, is it OK to do Git reset hard, that's very useful. Uh, if you don't, then maybe you shoot yourself in the foot, and you, you'll learn even less of Git than you should. And some people don't want to learn it. And that's OK. If you don't want to, then you shouldn't feel forced to. Um, because it's so hard. It can, and many people don't need it, it can be a major hurdle for contributors. So people want to contribute back to your project, but they have to learn Git first to do that, and many people don't like this. And then maybe you'll just lose the contribution, and you'll say, ah, yeah, whatever. Um, so the stuff that people have to do to contribute back is already quite substantial, right? So they have to know your project a little bit. They have to probably know the progr programming language you used, or may maybe you used multiple ones in the same project. They have to know the code base a little bit. They have to get around, find their way. Um, there are several project-specific policies and expectations that they have to be aware of, um, like the, the normal Git workflow for that specific proje project. What do I have to test? What is being tested by reviewers and maintainers? Code-style rules. Um, just how do I implement the bug? What, what do, you, do I really need to worry about backwards compatibility or, or not? Um, all of that stuff. and then on. On top of this, they have to learn Git and GitHub as well to even be able to do the right pull request, the way the maintainers actually want to see contributions. So the initial effort for people new to your project is huge. And it's very, at least in my experience, often underestimated. 
They need to do need to know all this stuff um, before even creating a contribution, and then on top of that, Git and GitHub as well. Uh, of course, documentation. Sorry, let me go back. Documentation here can be very useful, but it's not sufficient for everybody. So people don't even always read documentation, at least not the way it was intended to be read. Um, so it's not enough. So a little bit about EasyBuild, just to have some context here. Um, it's, it's a framework to install scientific software on HPC systems, which is not easy. It's not like installing gzip with configure, make, make, install. It's a lot more complex than that. And partially because of the scientists writing software. Um, it uses, EasyBuild uses easy config file as recipes, and I'll show one. So you have a, a, a reasonable idea of what it does. It's written in Python syntax, and it's basically key, key value definitions. It tells easy build which, easy, which version of the software to install and so on. Um, one of the most common contributions we get to easy build is people add a new recipe, a new easy config file for a new software version, for example, or build with a different compiler or anything like this. Because it's quite easy to do so because you can use an existing easy config file, copy it, change it a little bit, and then give it back if it, if it works for you. And that may be a very valuable contribution, even though it's a little bit of work. Um, people, it's, it's like a statement, this works for me, so it probably also works for you. And that's a very valuable contribution. We, we would like to see many of these. Now, to learn more about EasyBuild, I have a talk um, in the HPC dev room tomorrow uh, that compares EasyBuild with other tools. So if you want to learn more about EasyBuild, you can come there if you can wake up early enough. It's the first talk of the day. Um, so how does EasyBuild work? Well, you, you do EB, which is the main command. You give it the, the name of an easy config file, and it will pick up that file, parse it, see what actually wants to be installed, do the installation, it completes, and then the, the scientists can use the software. Um, so it consumes these easy config files that look a little bit like this. Now, and I'm not going to go into too much detail here, but one thing I do want to show is that it's very easy to tweak. So this is a software version. You can just bump it if there's a new um, software version and give us back that easy config file if the installation worked. You can change the compiler tool chain um, that was used to install the software, maybe tweak the dependencies, a newer version of Python. All of these things are quite trivial to, to change. Um, and then maybe you want to contribute it back to EasyBuild, hopefully. So to contribute back, you'll, well, you'll, need, you'll need a GitHub account because the, the, Git, the EasyBuild repository lives on GitHub. If you don't have that, you'll need to create it. You'll need to fork our Easy Configs repository into your GitHub account, so you have some place to contribute from. And then you clone uh, the repository. This is all quite easy. You only have to do this once, these three steps, right? And then you start working with Git. So again, you create a branch. You add the Easy Config file, which you had to put in the right place and give the right name first. You do the commit. You push it to origin, which is probably your fork on GitHub. And then you go to GitHub. If you're quick enough, you'll get a green button that you can click to make the contribution, which will give you this screen. And then here comes a little bit of policy, EasyBuild policy comes in. We expect you to make sure that you target the develop branch, which is not the default. We hopefully, we ask you to format your pull request title like this so we know what you're actually adding to EasyBuild. Maybe some useful information in the description. and you put, you have Better double check your changes to make sure you're not accidentally doing something wrong there. So that's, this is a bit of manual work. And then hopefully you can click the magic green button to create the pull request and you're done. Well, no, we're, you're not done yet. This is just starting the contribution. So now our Travis, so, so our Travis configuration is going to trigger automatically. It's going to do some tests on your easy config file, mainly looking like um, is it actually sensible? Does it have all the dependencies for other stuff? It, does it actually parse? So very simple things like this. Then at some point, the maintainer, one of the easy build maintainers, will review your pull request. Um, somebody will test it, so actually do the installation that your easy config file describes. And then hopefully also report back whether that worked for him. On, through the review, the reviewer may ask some things to be changed, or maybe Travis fails, and because of that, you have to go and change some minor things, which means you have to go back to Git. So, OK, back to square one. And maybe you have to do this even multiple times, because it's typically a review cycle, and you get some feedback over and over again. Um, 
And that may happen, certainly if you're a new contributor, this is typically what happens. Okay, so you got a review. Um, there were some small changes requested. You say, okay, I'm willing to do the extra effort. Go back to Git. First of all, you have to figure out the branch name you used for your pull request. You have to look at the pull request, copy paste the branch name. You were probably being funny there, so it's hard, hard to remember what you used. In this case, you use example. So you check out the example branch. We again make the necessary changes as requested by the reviewer. Do a git omit of all our changes. Now be careful with this because if you have other changes, it will suddenly push them in your branch as well, which you may not want to do. You push back the updated branch in your fork on GitHub, which will also update the pull request. And you have to do this a couple of times. So this is a lot of overhead. There's a lot of manual steps. You need to know Git a bit. You need to come up with a funny branch name, do four Git commands to set up the branch and push it to GitHub. You need to click around on GitHub to open the pull request and fill in some boxes. And then when re responding to the review, we have to do three more Git commands to fine tune the pull request. And then afterwards, if things got merged, you have two branches to worry about, the local one on your laptop and the remote one on GitHub that you better clean up. Otherwise, you have 100 branches before you know it. Um, and all of this, assuming that you actually know the project policies already, which may or may not be documented. In easy, in easy build they are, but no, nobody reads documentation, so they don't know. Um, and it also assumes that you don't mess up any Git commands, because if you do something wrong in between, you may even lose your work or anything like this. All right, so we have to do better than this, right? There has to be a better way. Um, the, the situation that triggered me to work on this was the, the race we were seeing in contributions in EasyBuild. So this is the green box is 2013, blue is 2014, and 2015 we had about twice uh, the amount of contributions we had before. So this was going up quite quickly, almost a thousand pull requests in a single year, and I was almost doing this by myself, reviewing contributions. It just didn't scale anymore. And I was getting really worried, like we're not going to be able to keep up if this keeps going. But of course, we want the contributions. We don't want to tell people, stop contributing. Um, so there's, there's a bit of conflict there. Um, also, a lot of people were struggling with the contribution procedure, with the policies, mainly with Git stuff. They were like, I, I tried something, it didn't work, or I messed up my branch, closed this pull request, open a new one. Lots of overhead there. We trying to explain to new people how to do things right, like try this Git branch and try a Git reset, but don't do dash dash hard because you're going to lose your work. So trying to be careful, lots of back and forth, lots of time being wasted. Some people even stopped contributing because of this. So they didn't, they were not familiar enough with Git yet. And they said, okay, I can't figure this out. I don't have time for this, forget it. Leave the contribution, close the pull request, and we never saw them back. So that, that was not good. Um, and then the irony here is EasyBuild is a, is a project that aims to automate installations. And then you have to do all this manual work to make a contribution. It just, it didn't make sense. Um, so I, I started working on, on the GitHub integration that we have today in EasyBuild. I, I did this mostly over Christmas, just because I was frustrated enough the week before that I couldn't get it out of my mind and I want, wanted to have some solution or at least try to come up with a solution. Um, so the idea was to automate the contribution workflow to make it a lot easier for people um, to make them lose less time and also to avoid direct interaction with Git because many people were not familiar enough to actually do the contribution. Um, the initial implementation had support for a bunch of things which I'll, I'll go over in a bit. And for now, it's limited to easy config files. We can actually extend this to other parts of EasyBuild and make it easier to, be con to do contributions there as well. So underneath, this is, act this is pretty basic. There's nothing really fancy going on. Um, there's a, a Git Python library, which is a wrapper around Git that you can just talk to Git from Python, which is, it works pretty well. Uh, GitHub has a very good REST API that you can talk to. Um, so this is just to automate the interaction with GitHub. So you don't have to click around with the mouse or even go to GitHub yourself. Um, you can automate this whole workflow. And then we use the keyring Python package to save the Git token that we need to um, talk to the GitHub API on your behalf, so with your account, without you having to enter a po um, password or anything. And this is specific to Python, but you, could, you can do the same thing in any other language. You can find libraries. Basically, all, the only thing you need is uh, something to talk to Git and then something to safely store the token. That's general enough that any language should really have it. So what, what did we add? We added support for 
opening new pull requests in the easy build command line. So EB new PR. You run it like this, you do EB new PR, you give it an easy config file, which can have any name, doesn't matter. Um, one single command, no git commands, no interaction with GitHub, that was the goal. What this will do is it will fetch the develop branch from the upstream, copy this easy config file in there um, to prepare. Then it will create a branch with an automatically derived branch name. You can pick your branch name if you really want to. If you want to be funny, you still can. Um, but this, does, this is just a timestamp and it checks from the easy config file which software and which version and tries to, tries to guess a reasonable name from that. You can actually just tell branches apart relatively easily. It will push this branch to GitHub for you. Just git push origin branch, right? Um, during the copy here, it's actually also renaming the easy config file based on what's in there and also getting the location right, so you don't have to do it yourself. Every easy config file you contribute can be test.eb, and if you do new PR, it will rename it properly the way you're supposed to do. Um, and then here it's preparing the pull request, so it's going to target our develop branch, it's gonna, it has auto-generated a PR title for you the way we would like it to have. And of course, you can override this. It has a description. The default description is just, this was created with EB new PR, which is useful. It, it's a bit of promotion for this as well. And then it uh, gives you a short overview, pretty much like Git stat does. And it opens the pull request for you by talking to the GitHub API. So there's a lot of stuff going on here in the background, but you only do one, one command, EB new PR, that's it. And everything else is done automatically. So to summarize, this is what you do manually, moving, renaming files, moving in the right location, a bunch of git commands, then logging into GitHub and then clicking around to open the pull request. Now you do this, one command. It does one single EB command, no git, no GitHub. Um, it pulls stuff, so it parses the easy config file to get all the renaming right and the PR title right, and it ends up saving a lot of time. Um, Pretty much the same thing for updating existing pull requests. So you do EB update PR, you give it the pull request number, you give it the updated easy config file, which again can have any name, it doesn't care. And here we force you to give a commit message yourself to describe the changes because this, this is typically changing a file that's already there rather than maybe something new. Um, from the pull request number, it will automatically determine the branch name so you don't have, you don't have to tell it, it knows. It talks to GitHub, what was the branch name for this pull request. It will check that out locally again and in a temporary directory. It will add the file, rename, do all of that stuff again. So put it in the right place. Um, it updates the files, moves it to the right location. It shows you an overview. So this was just changing one line, right? One line removed, one line added. Um, and then it pushes the modified branch to GitHub to, open the pull, uh, to update the pull request. And that's EB update PR, again, lots of stuff going on in the background, figuring out the branch name, checking out the local branch, going to the right place, changing the file, doing three git commands to push it, um, is now just one command. Again, lots of automation, you save a lot of time. One side effect of this is that you don't have a, a local branch anymore to, to clean up, because this is done in a temporary directory. When the update is done, it blows away the temporary directory, you, don't have, you never see the local branch. So there's no cleanup either. The reverse, kind of, is to use easy config files from a pull request. So if somebody has done a pull request and you want to test it, you need to pull in these easy config files on your system to play around with them. You don't have to do that manually. Again, no git commands. You do eb from PR, you give it a pull request number. It will pull in those easy config files. You can give them to easy build and do the test installation. So this is how we test contributions. Um, you can combine this with upload test report from PR and upload test report together. We'll do the installation and push back a test report in the pull request to notify the contributor like this also worked for me and it tested it on this system um, and so on. So this is what happens. It adds, a pull it adds a comment in the pull request with your account. It uses your GitHub tokens with your account. Um, so in this case, it failed for me and it, uh, it worked for me and it failed for Adam. And then inside, so it has a link here to a gist. If it was a successful test report, you get success here. You get a bunch of details, including some information about the system, like which processor, which OS. It collects that and pushes it in this test report. 
If it fails, you'll get a fail here and you'll get a separate link with the build log so you can check why it actually failed. You can check the errors of the installation and dive in and maybe make a suggestion to the contributor. Okay, this didn't work for me for this and this reason, so you'll need to make an update to your contribution. That's all really nice. We were quite happy with that. It was working quite well. So the GitHub integration got um, extended quite a bit. Um, I'm not going to cover all of these. Some of these, some of these are very detailed, but there's a couple that I want to go over. Uh, we have a check GitHub. So the new PR, update PR, all of this made it very easy for peop people to contribute. It automated the whole workflow, but they still had to set up the GitHub token, um, had to make sure Git Python was there, had to make sure the keyring module was there, that the token was installed in the right location, and that they didn't mess up copy-pasting the token, uh, all of these things. And we were getting many questions like, I want to set this up, but I'm not sure if it's actually right. Is there something missing? I have no way of checking. So we added check GitHub that does a bunch of checks. If all of these are OK, then we know that the GitHub integration works. And it basically tells you, based on these results, um, what it can do. So in this setup, all of these work. And if it doesn't, you'll get a useful error message here. And at least then that way we get more information, like you have this part missing. This is how you can fix it. Review PR, this is very specific to EasyBuild. So you can review PRs on GitHub, like it gives you a diff. Um, we get a lot of pull requests with new files, new easy config files. So there's no diff. There's just this big green box on GitHub. So that, that it means, that, means that the reviewer has to do a visual uh, reviewer, review. Sorry. Um, what we expect reviewers to do, or what we hope to do, um, is that they compare a new easy config files with existing ones. Because if it's just a version bump, you really want to see, OK, this is just a version bump, trivial. I can test it. If it works, contribution is good to go. Now, doing this manually is, is annoying, because you have to find easy config files that are close enough that you can compare it. You have to do the diff manually, because GitHub doesn't have this concept, right? You um, have to figure out what is actually relevant. So you pick the one with the same software version or the same tool chain, or what if none of these are there? Um, so in both in preview PR and review PR, we have this. This is the output of review PR. So for a particular pull request, it will go and find the closest matching easy config file. So this is a one for BAM tools 251. That's the contribution. We have one for 250. So this is a pretty close match, right? And it shows you the diff. The version number was bumped. The checksum was bumped. Everything else is the same. This looks like a very good contribution. So you test it. If it works, contribution is good to go. Contributors can do the same thing with preview PR. So before actually opening the pull request, they can run this, see the diff, and then see, OK, this is it only differs by version number, basically. So this is probably a good contribution. So it checks with the current upstream, um, because since you have copied the easy config file, stuff may have changed on our end. And you, you may want to need to see that as well. Also, for merging pull requests, we have a command, or an option at least. It does a couple of checks. So this is for maintainers, of course. A, a contributor cannot do this. This is to help ourselves. Um, it will verify whether a contribution is good to be merged. So is it to the right develop branch? Does it pass Travis? Do, does it have a test report that was submitted with upload test report? And was it successful? Um, is there an approved review? So we still look forced that a maintainer does an approved review on GitHub, a visual check. Um, is there a milestone set? So that's a detail. If all of these are OK, the pull request is good to go. And this will actually merge the pull request. So a maintainer doesn't have to do the double click on GitHub. This can do it for them. They don't have to do the visual check if all of these ticks are there. That happens automatically. So it helps us as well. We can very quickly open, uh, very quickly merge pull requests once we think everything is OK. And it double checks for us. So we, we can't make any mistakes there. The, the bot that I wrote, so this happened a lot later. Um, so we have Travis checking pull requests, doing very simple tests, unit tests, basically. If Travis fails, you'll see a red cross in the pull request. But that's it. If you don't go to the pull request and visually check it, you don't see that Travis failed. There's no, there's actually, as far as I have found, no way to configure Travis to notify both the contributor and the maintainer. So it then it cannot do a comment in the pull request or something. There's just no way to tell it to do that. So I wrote a bot that does that for me. Um, there's a bot that keeps an eye on Travis. Every time it sees a test for a particular pull request failing, the bot grabs the failing test from Travis 
and adds a comment in the pull request, which triggers a notification on GitHub to everybody involved. It seems to work really well. The reason we did this is that to tighten the review cycle or the update cycle you have for contributions. If somebody does a contribution um, and you never check back, then Travis may fail, but this pull, the pull request is just sitting there, it's not happening. If the bot drops in a comment, they get a mail, they see it failed, they check why it failed, oh, this is an easy fix, they fix it, and then Travis is triggered again, and hopefully goes green after. Okay, so I'm wrapping up slowly. Um, what kind of impact has this had on contribution? So we, I started implementing this in 2015, where we had about a thousand pull requests in the Easy Configs repository. Um, at the end of this year, this was implemented. So let's say in January, it was usable for the people that really wanted to. Um, and in 2016, about 500 pull requests were opened with new PR. So that's pretty good, and that's pretty much like the difference you see here. So was did we get more contributions thanks to new PR? We probably did. It's hard to tell, um, but I, I attribute this big raise to the automation we have. The year after, it, that almost doubled. So today, about 63% uh, of the contributions we get are through new PR. So people are doing contributions manually less and less, which was sort of the goal, right? I mean, even if you know Git, it helps you a lot because it does a whole lot of automation. They have a lot less things to worry about. You don't need to juggle branches. It makes things very easy, easy even for experienced people. So this is, for myself, if I add an easy config file, this is how I do it. I never do a manual branch Git anymore. I use Git all the time, but not for doing contributions. Um, yeah, so we had 80% more pull requests in 16 and 17 compared to 2015. I think one of the main factors is because of the whole automation we have. And the same graph with different colors. This is green is merged, red is closed, pull request, and blue is still open. So in 2015, we were sort of keeping up with incoming pull requests, like 85% about, it's a little bit lower here, was actually getting merged. Uh, um, let's say 10% was getting closed because there were good reasons to close them. The ones that were open are, are maybe stale pull requests. Contributors never got back to them. Or there is some issue there that we never managed to fix, so it stays open. We should probably close these as well and just get them out of the way, because they're probably not important anymore today. Um, even though p contributions were really raising quite quickly in 2016, we were able to keep up the 80-85% merged. So that's thanks to things like EB Review PR, EB Merge PR, so that automate things a lot for maintainers as well and save them time. That means they have time to do more. Uh, reviews to test more contributions. Pretty much the same thing in 17. Uh, yeah, who knows what happened? What will happen in 18? Um, so I'm I'm reasonably sure that keeping the 80, 85 percent merged to that level that would have been impossible without the automation. We would have been would have, have to close more pull requests or just keep them open, ignore them. I don't know what would have happened. So to conclude. I think Git can be a major hurdle for contributors. That's what we saw in Easy Builds. People that are not software developers, but that still want to contribute to your project. And their contributions may be very good, so you don't want to miss them. Um, Git can be a hurdle there that stops them from contributing. Um, you can actually automate pretty much the whole workflow, which is good, so you should probably do it. We did it with Git Python and the REST, uh, REST API of GitHub, which is very well documented. Today, contributors contributors don't need to use Git anymore if they don't want to. They still can. We still happily accept pull requests that were done manually. We can't really tell the difference. Or maybe we can because we, we need to uh, complain more about them or get some more work done. Um, even if somebody opens a pull request manually, we still get the benefit of review PR, merge PR, upload test report. That still works even if it was done manually. There's no, there's no impact there, so that's good. So I think we have gotten more contributions thanks to this. We've been able to keep up with incoming contributions, even though it has been going up quite a lot. And yeah, there's less time wasted <coughs> overall for everybody involved, both maintainers and contributors. That's what I had. So I'm happy to take any questions that people may have. Yeah. How does the Git repository scale up? How does Git scale up with yeah. getting many contributions? Yeah. Really well, we're not the Linux kernel. So the Linux kernel gets the 
10 or 100 times the amount of the volume that we do. Um, no. So Git was really built to get lots of contributions, lots of changes like this. It handles it perfectly. That's a very good question. So that's actually an, an idea I've had to maybe make this a library of some sort that people can talk to. Um, it's an option, but it's not a project I want to start. I already have too much work with, <laughs> with Easy Build. It's not something else I want to. So I can uh, look at your source. And sure, it's, it's all on GitHub. So the whole GitHub integration implementation is in our repository. It's a github.py file somewhere, GPLv2, you can use it. You can take a look at it, how we did it, and maybe inspire yourself. You, like I said, it, I think this is easy to do also in other languages. If you have the right libraries for it, you can do it. There's a, a boot somewhere here at Fosdem, gitmate.io. I should probably take a look at it. They do not this, but also a lot of automation around this. I was talking to the guy, and he was stuck at his boot. He couldn't come here. Um, but I hope he checks the video if he's watching. Hi. Um, so they had some ideas like this as well, and they will probably look at what we did and get inspired by this, hopefully. So you may see it as a service even somewhere, mm -hmm. rather than a library. Yeah. Uh, something is bugging me. Uh, All right. I, I can see how your tool is helping the maintainer, yeah. uh, how it helps the contribution to the integration, how data files. Uh, yeah. If you want to contribute code and, and uh, do active development, you anyway need to know all these prerequisites to contribute. You need to know Git. I don't know if you do. I mean, EasyBuild is, is a Python project, so you can very ac easily access the code, right? The code is always there. If you find a bug somewhere, and sometimes even if you don't know Python, you can dive in and say, ah, oh, they got this wrong. This true has to be a false, whatever, something like that. That's an easy patch. But then you have this updated Git, uh, Python file, and then you need to learn Git to push it back. No. So something we want to do in EasyBuild is EB new PR, let's say tools.py, which lives somewhere. New PR could even figure out where it has to be, because it, it can check what's in the file, put it in the right place, create the branch, push the branch to GitHub, do the pull request. Why not? Uh, well, I get your point. I, I honestly just can't imagine you know, a developer who, who doesn't work with GitHub nowadays. <laughs> not everybody is a developer. If you're an active developer, I, I use Git all the time. Don't get me wrong. It's very good if you know it. And if you need it every day, you, if you're doing software development, you should learn Git. Don't get me wrong. If you're a one-time contributor that happened to bump into a bug that was easy to fix, but you don't know Git, it shouldn't stop you from contributing back. It's two different worlds. We have a lot of sysadmins, like um, people that do user support on supercomputers. They don't develop any software. But they have to install software, so they use EasyBuild. And they, and they find bugs in EasyBuild and try to fix them because they're proud that they can fix the. If you fix a bug, you could, you're very proud that you can contribute it back, right? You have to learn Git first to be proud. Yeah, maybe you won't. In the back? Oh. Yeah, I can, I can. I, I heard you say big problems with scientists, so. <laughs> There it gets hairy, and we don't, at least in this, there's no solution for that. Easy build doesn't, no, no. So th at the time you create a pull request, it will pull in the latest upstream automatically, so it will pull our develop branch and base your changes on that. So at that time, there's not going to be a merge conflict. But of course, as the pull request is open, then suddenly a merge conflict may appear. And then, yeah, then you're really stuck to Git. Then there's no other option. Um, what we then tend to do if people don't know Git is we can grab their branch, we can fix the pull request, uh, the merge conflict for them, give them a pull request on their branch, and tell them, look, this fixes it. Just merge it. Even if, if you don't know what's going on, merge it. Trust me. It will open. It will update the pull request, and they will see still what we did, which is hopefully nothing. Just fix the fix the merge conflict. So then we can do that if we really have to. It's an easy config. It's uncommon to have merge conflicts, because usually you're working on new files, and then you'll never have a merge conflict.
Yes. Yes. Some people do, but we discourage it. The, on, the online editor, yeah. yeah. Some, some people have done it, but you end up with, with brands name like patch one, patch two, patch three, patch four, patch 100. And then as, as a maintainer, you're like, uh, uh, patch 100, what was this about again? It, and it's still a lot of, like they still have to do the manual pull request and things like that, still cl clicking around. For some people that works better. Uh, people that use EasyBuild are used to using a terminal. So they're happy there. And then they're usually happy with using one command to do s get something done. But it still happens, true. We're, uh, we're, we're not blocking that. Or I find that like it for, for typo fixes. Yeah, like in documentation, that's actually exactly where we see it a lot. <coughs> There's a typo in the documentation. They found the file, they do an edit, and GitHub will create the branch for them, right? Yeah. yeah. And even make the pull request for them, I think. Yeah. So it's very, yeah. We, it happens, sure. Well, also certainly to, to, to have to have a GitHub account, if you, especially if you don't have it yet. So True, that, that was the, fir the three steps you still have to do, yeah. Uh, what, what were the three steps? Cre create an account, right? Create an account, um, fork the repository, and do a Git clone. Okay, so... Well, the Git clone is actually not really necessary anymore with... Uh, Not today, because we push the branch to GitHub and we you talk to the GitHub API to open the pull request. Okay. If you have ideas there, I'm keen to hear them, because we c then we can get rid of this. Yeah, I'm not really completely familiar with it, but uh, in general then, how doable or undoable is it to contribute to GitHub projects without GitHub? So just sending plain Git fetches over email, for example. That's what a Linux kernel does, so there must be something right there. Um, it, 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 it would actually be possible if you don't have a GitHub account, EB New PR could trigger a mail <coughs> to somebody and then you could then have like a cron job that pulls in the mails and creates a branch on somebody else's account. Yeah, it could work. You could actually make it work. But is it creating a GitHub account really that hard? <coughs> if, if this is a hurdle for a contribution, then I don't think you care enough to well, contribute. It's not just Bitbucket, uh, GitLab, yeah. Etc. 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 Sure. So uh, there's still a hurdle. Maybe that's just my comment then. Uh, sure. Uh, adding to your talk. Maybe uh, people don't want to have a GitHub account. Exactly. Yeah. yeah. And, and there's, I suppose, going to show PC vaults. So sure. You have to agree with stuff. Yeah. 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 That's a good point. Yeah. And it, it could be done. I don't think there's any technical hurdle there. You just need some other way to grab the patch and somehow still get it on GitHub because that's where we're going to merge it. Uh, but it, you could do it, sure. It, um, current situation, you, know, you have to have a GitHub account. Clear. Yes, okay. because we've never had the question from somebody, I don't want to have a GitHub account, but still want to contribute back. It hasn't happened. Okay. So I don't think we'll spend time on it for now. But in general, you could do it, yeah. All right, thank you. Any more questions? OK, if not, I uploaded my slides on the FOSDEM website. I hope it was recorded. So show it to your friends. <laughs> Thank you.